appreciate your interest in the Word of God. Today we want to share some thoughts from Genesis chapter 6, 7, and maybe referring a little further into 8. Um, what we plan to do is read the Scripture together first, and then we'll go into commentary on the Scripture. I am indebted to various people um, for insight that I have learned. <clears throat> Most of all, the Holy Spirit. I'm so grateful for the Word of God that is alive and powerful and sharp. And we want to learn from this. First of all, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask for your help today as we look at your Word. Please give us what we need to be conformed in the image of Jesus Christ and abide in Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's begin by reading Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wise of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto, children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood, room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. This is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be three hundred cubits, the breadth of it fifty cubits, and the height of it thirty cubits. A window shalt thou make in the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, which with lower, second, and third stories thou shalt make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark, to keep them alive with thee, and they shall be male and female." Of fowls of their kind, and of cattle of their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come in unto thee, to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be food for thee, and for them. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Chapter 7 verse 1 says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast shalt thou take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days will I cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. 
And Noah did according to all, according unto all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him, into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean beasts, and of beasts that are not clean, and of fowls, and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. There went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the seventeenth day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. In the selfsame day entered Noah, and Shem, and Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with him, with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon this earth, upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in, and they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they, and they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased, and bare up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth. <clears throat> The current history that we're reading came to pass, or that we read came to pass in the seeming safety of daily living it up in a very different world, a world that is very different than than today's world. The old world was a lush greenhouse, very comfortable, with plants, animals, and people that grew to enormous stature. It had men of mighty deeds, gorgeous women, intermarriage, Giants, as mentioned, great wickedness, corruption, and an earth filled with violence. All flesh corrupted itself, as it tells us in verse 12 of chapter 6. It it seems like Sodom, Sodom who went after strange flesh and was judged, purged, or cleansed with fire. But that time, the time in Genesis chapter 6 and 7, The world was washed with water. That era also seems like today. And the next time, our world will be purged with fire. I say it seems like today, and our Lord told us that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And the next time that it's purged with fire, it will be Christ himself who does it? The first time God says, I, even I, will, be, will bring a flood upon the earth. The next time it will be our Lord and Savior, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire, as John the Baptist stated in Matthew, 5, Matthew 3.12. Through Jesus Christ, the Christian, however, is already judged. He burns away. He, uh, he saves us from our sins as we walk in the light, as He is in the light, and He leads us into, into whole, heart holiness. He burns away all inbred sin with the fire of the Holy Spirit. Now, without Christ, you and I cannot stand, for we will face that judgment alone with no merit to stand on if we are judged in our sins. At the end of time, First Thessalonians four sixteen and seventeen and eighteen tells us: For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, angel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Our Lord is coming again, and He's coming to judge 
Enoch also, uh, uh, Jude one fourteen tells us. By the way, uh, Jude, another word, name for Jude is Judas. Now, the Judas um, who betrayed Christ with a kiss was a traitor. He was a he was he went into apostasy, and um, it's interesting how Jude, which is also could be which we could also call Judas, um, warns us of the coming apostasy and near the end of uh, this age, <clears throat> and in there in Jude uh, fourteen fifteen and sixteen, we are told an Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. We could say with myriads of his saints. Uh, with myriads. Uh, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches with which ungodly sinners has spoken against him. Wow. Um, Jude is really, um, the Holy Spirit through Jude is really getting a point across uh, ungodliness near the end of time. And oh, we've reached that time of ungodliness. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. I noticed the phrase above in verse 15, of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. We are living in a day just like before, but it seems like more than ever before. So much speeches, books are written, there's publications propaganda against the church against Christ against against Christianity and um, all with the intent of tearing it down tearing down Christ's kingdom but Christ will triumph someday there will be judgment um, when Christ comes with ten thousands of his saints and um, the Christian has nothing to worry about uh, because God is going to take care of those who are following after Him. Now in reference back to Matthew 3.12, which says whose fan is in His hand, Christ's fan is in His hand, and He will thoroughly purge His floor, thoroughly purge His floor and gather His wheat into the garner, but He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Just Lot was spared when the fire came upon Sodom and Gomorrah, and perfect Noah was spared when the water came upon the earth. In fact, he was even protected while preaching righteousness to the violent around him. So also, those who are Christ will be spared, refined and spared. Now regarding Noah's preaching, Noah and some other prophets were not promised results. Uh, we are James 5 verse 7 says, refers to the early and the latter rain. Now that was given after Pentecost. Um, so we can expect that we are in, we could see God um, bringing in souls to the very end, the latter rain. We are also promised, ask of me and I will give you the heathen for thine inheritance. Um, we are living in a great day, a day in which we can expect much from God. We are nearing the great day of the Lord. Yet to the last generation, He tells us, Call upon me and I will answer you. Folks, let's ask God for great things. He promises to answer. He answers by fire. He wants to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. Now, before the flood, they were doing what it's easy to get caught up doing today. Eating, drinking, marrying, and giving a marriage. Fun life. Busy life. Not all bad. Men and women, parents, 
fathers, mothers. Let me tell you something. We need, we must every day strive to convince our families, our loved ones, our children that we must must keep number one what is important in our lives. Walking with God, being a friend with God, knowing God. We got to keep that important. Day after day, we must try. We must keep this in mind, and uh, have it as a focus on what we're trying to get across to our family, to our children, those we love. <clears throat> Your exploits, my exploits, do not matter. Even before the flood, there were many men of renown, but only those who were holy, obedient, and in communion with God were saved. Now, if you are too caught up in life to walk closely with God in close communion with Him, you're too busy and you need to make some serious adjustments before it's too late. Now, do you think Noah was following and keeping up with and curious about and comparing himself to those around him who were having a merry time, yet also destitute of godliness and eventually to perish? We know the answer to that. We... Of course not. He was in fear and trembling and in love and faith, walking perfectly before God. And God was looking out for Noah. This, my friends and brethren, this is the good life. He made known his ways unto Moses and his acts unto the children of Israel. The closeness of God was made known uh, to Moses, the, uh, his ways, why he was doing things, and so forth. What he's going to do? The, the children of Israel only got to see his acts because they were close to Moses, but not to God. Those stiff necked children of Israel and God's mercy still got to see God's acts performed. But it was Moses who was intimate with God, who always heard from God, and God made known his ways to him. Moses was walking with God. And we also can be in close communion with God. The busy, worldly world knows nothing of such precious blessings of joy and peace and satisfaction in Christ Jesus by walking in close communion with God as Noah did. Now, the third verse of Genesis chapter 6 says, My spirit shall not always strive with man. The mercy of God continued to strive 120 years longer in spite of knowing how things would turn out. God strove through Noah's preaching and by inward checks, knowing that it was in vain with most of the people then. Just like today, God is not willing that any should perish, for His mercy is great and endures to all generations. Hallelujah. Now, verses 5 and 6, And God saw the wickedness was great, and that every imagination only evil continually, and it repented the Lord. This verse teaches the inward depravity of every man. And man was such in that day that every thought was only evil continually, and he was constantly imagining how to perform more evil. God resented man's wickedness. God was not unconcerned, but rather injured. Now we know that God cannot be injured by us. We cannot injure God. He doesn't need us. That's a figure of speech. He was injured and affronted by sin. God saw sin in his creation. Then, as a tender father sees the folly and, folly and the stubbornness of a rebellious and hopelessly and willfully disobedient child, and such not only displeases him, but grieves him, and even makes him think that it would have been better if he had been written childless. As before the flood, so after the flood, man continues and is completely depraved. Nothing has changed in that aspect. Through and through he is corrupted by sin. How soon after the flood man turned back to sin, while Noah's son Shem was still alive, Sodom and Gomorrah had to be wiped away by fire. They didn't learn. Shem lived about 50 years after Sodom and, Gomorrah, after Sodom and Gomorrah's demise. Today, the answer for men's sinful depravity is not a flood. It's not an ark. 
Our salvation today rests in Christ, and the door to Christ remains open and will remain open until the end of time. His mercy endureth to all generations. And I just want to say something there because I heard, uh, I know I've heard preaching. <clears throat> I believe it's incorrect that at some point in time, before the end of time, God's Spirit will be taken away from the earth, so to speak. I don't know how exactly the thought process goes with some. But they basically said that there'll be no more help, no more hope. There'll be sinners seeking after God, but it will be too late. Um, as long as they're on this earth with life, it's not too late. Uh, we have the promise of God telling us that His mercy endured to all generations. Um, <clears throat> now, when time shall be no more, and the earth is wiped away by fire, and all the lives are lost, and people stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and are in eternity, there where the tree falls, there it lies. But until then, there's hope. Keep praying for those, uh, no matter how bad things may get, keep praying that people will find God. And may they turn to God in faith. Genesis chapter 6, verses 8 and 9, tells us that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a just man and perfect, and Noah walked with God. Though Noah had been born sinful, we know that he had been renewed, through repentance and faith, and had obtained witness that he was righteous. He was an heir of the righteousness which is by faith, according to Hebrews 9. He was justified and sanctified, for he was blameless before God. And he walked with God as Enoch had done before him. Enoch for three hundred years before being taken alive to paradise had walked with God. He began walking with God in his 65th year, from what we understand from Scripture. Noah also, in his generation, walked with God. In spite of living in that corrupt and degenerate age, Noah did not follow the faction. Rather, he was perfect before God when no one else seemed to be such. And so he found grace. Noah lived redemptively. He not only warned in love, but he lived among sinners as salt and so helped preserve his generation from destruction for 120 years. We are here today because Noah found grace. The world continues today because of people like Noah. Oh God, make me that one who stands before you and stands in the gap so that you do not destroy the land. God is looking for such a one like this. He is so full of mercy and tender compassion. And if Noah could be kept perfect before the era of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit and in the age of grace, how much more may God's grace abound in us? How much more may we walk be got before God perfectly? Genesis 6.13 says, The end of all flesh has come before me. It's approaching. It's at the very door. We are living in such a day also. I will destroy them with the earth but make thee an ark. And through your obedience, I will keep you safe and save you. God could have preserved Noah by means of miracle angels, lifting him up off of the earth without making him go through any pains. But God chose to employ him in making that which would be the means of his preservation, both to try his faith and obedience and to teach us that none shall be saved by Christ, but only those that work out their salvation through faith and obedience. We cannot do it without God, and He will not do it without us. God's providence and His grace crown the endeavors of the obedient and the diligent, those who daily walk with God in Christ. God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh. When Noah found grace, he heard sweet secrets from God, even in the worst of days. I long to walk with God and abide in the secret place of the Most High and know God's ways and hear from God and have special communion, intimate communion with God through His Word and prayer. We know from God's Word and from experience and from the testimonies of multitudes of saints that God graces His children who wait on Him with such.
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. They'll see him through the eyes of faith. They will be in his presence. Genesis 6.14 tells us, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. These are Old Testament types. Within, without, and the Old Testament types, within and without, have something to do with the atonement. The ark is a type of Christ. Safety, one door, salvation from judgment. In Exodus 25, 11, we see the same phrase, and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, referring to the ark of the covenant. Within and without shalt thou overlay it and shalt make upon it a crown of gold about. Both the Ark of the Covenant and the Ark that Noah built by God's direction, both are covered within and without. Both are meant to come to rest. Both are made of simple wood. Both offer a new beginning. Both represent God in some form or another. The Ark of the Covenant was covered in purest gold, contained manna, living bread. The rod which comforts, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The Ten Commandments, the eternal word of life, contained God's glory and presence, was not made to parade around for show, for instance, in battle and so forth, but to be hidden from the eyes, even the eyes of, the, of most of the priests. Only the high priest could see it at appointed times. And it was made to rest in a high and holy, quiet place. Yes, the ark of, um, that God directed Noah to, to build within, uh, to certain specifications was pitched within without with pitch. And as um, one brother told me, Brother Hosker, he's heard so many of the old timers say, that represents two works of grace. A forgiveness from sin, cleaned up on the inside, and entire sanctification from all inbred sin, cleaned on the inside. Regarding God's covenant with Noah, verses 18 and 19, God's covenant with Noah brought life, it brought blessing, it brought safety. Even blessings came upon his family. Blessed are the children of those who delight in God's laws. Let's turn to Psalm 112. Start reading with verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is a man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed. Okay, so we have the first part. Delighting greatly in his commandments that uh, we're, we're referring to delighting in God's laws, delighting greatly in God's commandments, saying, oh God, thank you. Yes, I want to do this. I love to read your word. I love your word. I want to keep your word. His seed, this man's seed, shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Over and over again, I thank God for my godly heritage for my mother and father, my, my father and my mother, my wife's father and mother as well, who love God and who who um, fear God and have kept His commandments and have endeavored to do so for years. And even if a person decides to reject God after having parents who fear God and keep his commandments and delight greatly in his commandments. Even if a person decides to reject God, they receive so many blessings through the parents. Now, you may not have had that opportunity, but you can start that opportunity for others. You may not have children, but you can have godly spiritual offspring and you can pass on to them blessings. Now, 
Genesis 6.22, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Then also in verse chapter 7.5, it tells us the same. That Noah did according to all that God commanded, so did he. He truly delighted in God's laws and what God had to tell him. Now this is very important. God twice repeated this in the story of the flood. That Noah did according to all that God commanded him. So did he. It reminds me of uh, what God tells us that Moses did according to all that God commanded him in the building of the tabernacle. Over and over again, at least 10 different times, it tells us that according to all that God commanded him, Noah did that in building the tabernacle. Immediately following this, in Exodus 40, 34, and 38, it says, God's word tells us that God's glory filled the temple. Filled the temple in a mighty way. It it seems like they couldn't even enter the temple, if I remember the story correctly. Um, And the little things, God commanded Moses this way, and Moses did this. God commanded Moses to do this regarding the temple, and Moses did it. God commanded Moses to do this regarding the temple. And Noah and Moses did it. It is the little things that are dangerous, and it is the little things that bring glory, God's glory upon the life of a saint. We are God's temple. And we are such as God wants in every little thing. Uh, we, re- we have glory on our lives. And I look at some of the older saints as a young person, I would see things alive in their lives and not think it was very important. But the older I get, the more I realize those little things did matter. And um, God is showing me the importance of certain little things. And I thank God for that. So, all that God commanded him, so did he. When we consider how laborious, tedious, dangerous, And great was the work of building the ark, said Joseph Benson, that great Methodist commentator. And when we consider that he was the ridicule, that um, when we consider all the ridicule he would have to surmount from the ungodly and from the profane, when we consider how it must have used all his resources and all of his time and consumed all of his family's teamwork and his intellectual powers, now I'm getting to my own speculation here, along with paying any, any others willing to help him build it. Think about all the wood that it used and all the wood that had to be brought in from other areas. When, he, um, when we think about all this, it is no wonder that God in the Holy Scriptures so celebrates his great faith in Hebrews 11, verse 7. This is the way that Noah saved himself, his wife, and his family. And likewise, it will be that the righteous scarcely are saved. It will take the miracle of God's working grace along with everything that the Christian has. Jesus says that if any man would follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It is a beautiful wonder that God responds with an outpouring of grace when a man cries out from the flesh and the world and says, Save me! God takes him in and pulls him away from the flesh and the world and saves him from sin. And that, ra- that man receives the grace of God to strive the rest of his life in following God just like Noah. Praise the Lord! And like Noah, God makes a covenant with him and God takes him and teaches him and leads him and how to save himself from coming judgment against sin. Genesis 7, 4, For yet seven days long the world had awaited the fulfillment of this prophecy, and now the time had arrived. God tells them in just seven days the flood will come. Now the prophet Enoch first prophesied at this time, When at the age of 65, when his son was born, he named his son Methuselah. Now he must have had a vision of what God was going to do. He believed that vision, named his son prophetically of that, 
And then he walked with God in fear and carefulness all the rest of his days of his life. Ancient Jews believe that Methuselah died this very day. What day? The day of when God says, for yet seven days. And now Methuselah's name means, uh, literally, he dieth and the sending forth. Prophetical of the flood. If I remember correctly, it seems like the sending forth has to do with something with the, it also has connotations of perhaps a fiery missile. Um, now that could lead us to all kinds of geological speculation and it's simply that speculation. We don't know if God, what kind of type of geological irregularities God used to bring the flood if it were, if it was a uh, falling comet that burst through the canopy above the earth and into the and split into the earth releasing the floods from inside the earth I don't know um, it could have been some type of a, a rend volcanic super volcano that exploded the earth's crust and opened up the the great deep and blew massive amounts with supersonic um, speed through the atmosphere bursting through the 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 great deep above the earth of water and um, I don't know and we could speculate more about that in reading we've done <clears throat> but it's all speculation so we don't know how the sending forth was except that very literally the flood was sent and it happened when, he, when uh, Methuselah died it's also it's computed that Methuselah died in the year of the catastrophe Notice how Methuselah lived longer than anyone else recorded in the Bible. This speaks of God's great mercy and his long suffering, for God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God warned and warned and warned back from Enoch in the name of his son through Noah's life as he preached for 120 years that God was going to destroy the earth with a flood. And now God finally tells him the time had come and God tells them as a statement and as a warning and as a um, relaying to them the time had come to enter in yet seven days. God in his long-suffering mercy gave one more warning and Noah, I think, probably relayed that message of God to others. Many who had slighted the message for 120 years had one more time to think soberly. Here's a thought. And some godly Methodists believe that although they were destroyed as to their bodies by the flood because of their former and long continued impenitence, yet some of them souls might have been saved through sincere repentance before they perished. Now, this is all speculation. We don't know uh, that it happened this way, nor does anyone know that it didn't happen this way. One great Methodist preacher said that he believed that God caused it to rain for 40 days to give them a chance to repent in faith before they perished, and that it is likely that some who were preserved from the waters of the ark nevertheless at last perished in hell so some that were drowned in the flood might be eternally saved in heaven. And he gave uh, 1 Peter 4, 6 in reference to that. Some who have squandered away their health turn to God when staring death in the face. Now we're not guaranteed of the opportunity nor of faith at our dying hour, but God in mercy to all generations is calling to those who will turn and live. Genesis 8.20 Noah built an altar unto the Lord and the Lord smelled a sweet savor and said beautiful things in his heart. Noah continued his righteous gratefulness and his worship just as he had always done even after the flood. This time after being spared from the flood and, being, and, coming, and descending from the ark this time his gratefulness and worship was, was, was with fresh gratitude. God received his worship with pleasure and vowed that he would never smite the earth in the way that he had done 
Had God promised seasons to continue while earth remaineth, there would be um, seed time and harvest, summer and winter, day and night. And God made a covenant with Noah and his posterity, which includes us. Thank the Lord. That, that covenant includes us. Likewise, your righteous life and worship and praise calls down blessings of God upon our lives, upon your life and the life of those around you and upon this earth. You are salt preservers. You, Christian, you Christians are salt preservers. This even happened with Lot. Remember in Genesis 19, 22, um, the angel says, Haste thee, escape thither, for I could not do anything till thou become thither. Till. Now when God says until, it's important. So look at the blessing and the protection that came down upon those around Lot. As long as Lot was in that city, God cannot bring judgment upon it because he was just. Now he had a lot of, he had a, a, made a lot of foolish mistakes, but the scripture does tell us that he vexed his soul daily with the wickedness of those around him. He was just. And um, regarding, to, regarding his foolish mistakes, a godly man can make some serious mistakes. And Lot made some serious mistakes and lost his family out of it. Uh, but, um, but he loved God. So notice with Lot, he was a salt. He was a preserver. God could not do anything till he had, been, he had come thither. So we see the blessing and protection that we bring down upon those around us. You bring down blessing and protection upon those around you if you are serving God. It is no wonder that in the Hall of Faith hero chapter in Hebrews, God says that the world is not worthy of those of faith. May God help us to live worthy of our high and holy calling. Genesis 9, 1, God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Here God assures Noah and all of us, Noah's posterity, of God's goodwill toward us and of his gracious intentions concerning us um, when he calls upon us in childlike faith in him, childlike trust in him to fill the earth with our children whom he wants to bless. For God seeks a godly seed to become his bride and to do great things through them and to stand in the gap. Malachi 2.14 tells us, Yet the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, she, thy companion, and the wife of thy covenant. And did he not make one and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, this is Isaiah now, Isaiah 62, 5, and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. Marriage is a beautiful, important thing, it brings beautiful fruit, children, and it's blessed of God. God uh, warns those who deal treacherously against their wife. And also marriage is a type of Christ's love for the church. And Christ loved the church and gave himself for the church. So he hates putting away because God's mercy endures to all generations and he is ever calling for uh, his church to follow him and to do his will. <clears throat> and to love him in return. So therefore, God wants men to do the same with their wives. And he that finds a wife finds a good thing and finds favor with the Lord. It doesn't just say he that finds a good wife or a virtuous woman or a great wife. It says he that finds a wife finds a good thing and favor with the Lord. I love my wife, but I also love the favor that I receive from having her. I would hate to put her away and, and not only lose God's favor, but have God um, recompense me. May God help our nation and our culture today who is not only marrying and giving in marriage, but also putting away. It's a great curse upon our land. 
Genesis 9, 9, 11, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. Remember, he wants them to multiply and fill the earth. And with your seed after you, and I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall there be any more a flood to destroy the earth. And they truly multiplied God, uh, they truly did multiply in obedience to God quickly. As we see this, the earth filled with cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, um, uh, Already being there when Shem, Noah's son, is uh, still yet alive. It speaks of longevity of the people living at that time of Shem's life. But it also speaks of how they truly obeyed God. So to the seed of Noah and to Noah, God made a covenant that he would never again destroy the entire earth with water. The fossil record shows a graveyard of billions and billions of dead things buried by judgment against sin by water. Remember, death came by sin. And they were buried even on the tops of the highest mountains, as God's holy record assures us. 2 Peter 3, verses 5, second part of that says, By the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now we recognize that there was the old world, the world that then was, and now we live in the world that, th- that now is, after fire, judgment of fire, there will be, the world will be a new world. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Oh, so many petty things that people are living for, but they really don't matter. It really doesn't matter. And let us warn others of this coming day. Let us warn others so they can be ready. Let's be salt like Noah. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, Verse 14, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Folks, this is so beautiful because today also God offers not an ark of safety as it was in the days of Noah. But God offers His very own Son, Jesus Christ, Himself as our great salvation. He is a double salvation. Salvation from committing sin and a salvation of a holy heart. Through this covenant made by the blood of Jesus Christ, He Himself comes into our lives and we begin to abide in Christ. I thank God for the many, many times that God's comforter has come to me by my side and warned me to be careful of something. He wants us to be saved. He's there for you. He's going to help you. When I was being accused by the accuser, Satan, God's spirit came to my rescue. Even when I messed things up, I immediately had an advocate through the blood of Jesus Christ, the righteous. And God has been merciful to keep me after all these years. He keeps me holy. We don't need to fear that which is coming upon the world because we have already been judged in Christ. 
Christ went through um, what we should have received, what we should have received. Our next judgment will be like the reward ceremony for the deeds we have done in Christ. Judgment begins at the house of God and it fell on Christ for our sins. We have eternal life. It's not we shall have eternal life. We have eternal life. We have now and shall have forever eternal life. We rejoice evermore and shall rejoice forevermore. His promises are sweet. His comfort is sure. His love is everlasting and His goodness is daily. We walk in newness of life until Jesus comes. Through Jesus Christ, our great salvation and forgiveness of sins and entire sanctification, our whole spirit, soul, and body is preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 5.23